Jonathan Dan. All right, hey guys. Ryan, because of you saying that and reminding me, even though that was a couple months back, I almost literally just took off my pants right there. <laughs> but you guys do have that code of conduct I gotta listen to. Um, so the, the PPC Performance Pizza that we're gonna go over today wouldn't be complete if we also couldn't play a game. And so next to where you guys are sitting or maybe under your seat, there's a little pizza box inside and we're actually gonna play a game while we go through these slides. Um, are there any people that don't have a pizza box right now? Okay, because we have some help right here. They're gonna go around and get you guys set up. Because <clears throat> we're also getting ready for lunch anyways, right? So we gotta start building that appetite. So when we're going through these slides, all you really have to do is open your pizza box, look at your little Trivial Pursuit style stickers, and if you guys are doing what I'm about to cover already, you've earned that slice. You get to put it on your game board, and then when this talk is over, you can go to our booth. We now have some new pizza slices on our pizza wheel, and one of them is a grand prize. And that grand prize is actually worth $10,000. Now, what is in that secret box? Well, first of all, there are custom-made Nike Elite Pepperoni Pizza basketball socks. These are like $12 a pair. They're the most cushiony socks you've ever worn in your life. There's a beach blanket. Wait, you guys, I just broke the code of conduct because I had to put a shirt on him earlier. You, do, you have the wrong slide deck up. That's fine, I'm okay with it. Um, there's also a pajama onesie, basically saying, love fades, pizza is forever. You also get um, an iPad mini and a pair of Beats headphones. You also get access to our newly launched courses um, of our academy that we're actually using internally to teach everybody that's working with us, and we're now selling it and releasing it to everybody outside. And the coolest part is that we have a full year of Slack support. So anything that you run into, whether it be Google AdWords, Facebook, landing pages, we're gonna help you out. And last but not least, this is all custom delivered straight to you today from our own pizza delivery boy, Matt. <laughs> and he will keep his shirt off for this. So, let's get started. The first thing you guys might be familiar with was the iceberg effect from last year. Since then, we now basically have the 2.0 version coming out, and we've been able to test it across 100 different clients that we have, from an Arizona landscape company, small local shop, to the bigger global spenders of Stanford and Airbnb that we're working with, and running some engineering experiments with their data scientists to figure out, does this thing actually hold up, this iceberg effect you know, thing? Um, but let me tell you what it means real quick. When you guys are setting up your AdWords account, your Facebook ads account, you have two extremes. You have the super, super simple side, where you have one keyword or one audience per ad group or ad set, and then you have the chaotic side, where you kind of don't give an F, you're just putting it all in there and just hit go. Um, and most of us are somewhere in the middle. But the question I have for you guys is, why not go to the one side if you can? And the reason why you should start caring about that is because when you're bidding on keywords, you have control over them. But you will always, always have more search terms than keywords, and these are the things you cannot control. So when you have no predictability in your marketing and no consistency, you can look at this, and even though this iceberg is cute, we hate it with a passion, and you should too. If you look at your search term report, let's see here, yeah. So the keyword column is what you can actually control, and I know I'm getting very tactical. I wanna make sure that you guys have so much you can use when you go back home. Um, so if it's kind of over your head, don't worry about it, we can talk about it later. And on the left side, you have the search term column. If the search terms and keywords don't match up the way you want, you have a problem. The same thing happens with display side, when you actually have your um, targeting that's actually controlled and then you have your automatic placements, and the same thing happens with Facebook, too. It's like a little delayed, there we go, cool. Um, so the way to actually fix this 
and make sure that you're not suffering from these cute icebergs that you can't control, you want to use something called single keyword ad groups. For shopping, we call it single product ad groups. We actually try to extract the placements from display, and we do the same thing on the Facebook side where we just have one audience per ad set. We don't try to layer too much because, again, we want that control, that predictability. And the interesting thing is that Google and Facebook, if they really truly care about one metrics, it's click-through rate because they know that you're relevant to the audience, right? Their, their worst fear is that they're gonna, people are going to start using Bing or a different, obviously not MySpace because that's no longer, so that's a bad example. Um, but they're just afraid that they're going to stop seeing relevant results, whether they be organic listings or ads too, right? So even though we as smart marketers do not care as much about CTR, we care about conversion rates, we care about cost per conversion and conversion volume, that's what they care about. And when you care about that too, they will reward you with cheaper cost per clicks, which leads to cheaper CPAs, which means that you can outbid your competition if you wanted to and still maintain a healthy balance of your performance as you keep scaling. Um, the interesting thing too, and this is more the 2.0 side of why we care so much about this, is that your quality score, which is again, Google's one to 10 factor that actually tells you, are you relevant to your visitors, to the people who are searching for you? And if you get a 10, you are, which again, could lead to a lot of other good things. And so that quality score is actually set at the search term level. So again, if you're only focused on the keyword, what's above the surface when it comes to the iceberg, you don't see what's beneath, you're not gonna be making yourself better. Um, so here are how you set up what we call single keyword accuracy. This is a formula. We have what we call root keywords on the left-hand side. So basically meaning this is the shortest tail version keyword that still has intent that you can bid on that you should use in your single keyword ad group. You then have two ads. The headline one has a keyword in it, and the path has a keyword in it as well. And then everything else you can just test as you regularly would with ad copy testing. Um, and you use those match types too. Then from there, all you're going to focus on from now on out is a search term report. If the search term report, again, is showing you that some of the search terms are longer tail than the keyword, we're going to extract that, create a new SCAG, and use ad group level negatives. And then we're going to sort by uh, impressions in descending order. You guys with me? OK, cool, awesome. Um, so the, the entire name of the game in this situation is to turn the bigger icebergs into smaller ones. So if you guys are already doing this, you guys get to put down the pineapple slice. The next thing is what we do on Facebook. And again, I want to make sure that you guys can actually use these tactics right off the bat. Um, and I'm going to tell you what we set up and how we set it up so you can use it as well. The first thing that we do is we exhaust all custom audience builds. So Mary was talking about this a little bit yesterday too, about lookalike audiences and custom audiences. And custom audiences are just remarketing audiences that you're actually trying to go after, right? So people who have been on your site or your landing page or they're on your email list. <clears throat> These are the people who are most likely to actually come back and buy or convert with, you know, from you. Um, and you want to create it in that order. The biggest thing that you want to focus on first is creating a custom audience for people who've already bought or people who have converted on that core offer that you already have. The next thing is you want to create 1% lookalike audiences from the people who have bought because these are a mirror of the people you want to attract. But the lookalike audiences are people who have never heard about you before. All right? Now, one thing you want to keep in mind, and this happens again and again repeatedly, is that the two biggest drivers of Facebook performance success when it comes to paid is basically your audience and your offer. And we're going to talk about the threat levels, too, that we learned as well. Um, then you do saved audiences last. If you, if you can't uh, do custom audience or look like audience, you can start with saved audiences, but we prioritize those last. <clears throat> and again, keep in mind, one ad set, one audience. The next thing comes down to your actual ads. You're going to want to dark post as many ads as you possibly can. Dark posting basically means it's an unpublished page post, and it allows you to use that ad again and again and again in different ad sets as it accumulates social proof. So all your likes, all your shares, all your comments, those will be repeatedly used across different audiences because you're using that in different ad sets. And the other thing you want to keep in mind is that you can actually pre-promo and positively frame your ads before they even go live. So when you go into an ad set, you see this little arrow on the right side, and then it says Facebook post with comments. It will give you a URL. You can take that URL, send it to your mom, and have her send it to all of her friends. And then you can tell them to get some likes and some shares, and probably not the comments. Um, but you can actually then get that ready and then launch afterwards. Because what you don't want to happen is that as soon as the first negative comment hits your specific ad, 
and it's not a good one, it opens up the door for other people to also speak badly about you. It just happens. That's what happened to Juice Serial. You guys heard about Juice Serial? About the $400 uh, juice presser, there was an article where you can, just, you can actually squeeze it faster if you just do it yourself by hands. And so people were just like ripping them. Like, if you guys watch Silicon Valley, that's my favorite one up there at the top right. As if Baghetti from Silicon Valley is running the company. Like, people were mad. Um, then after that, you want to care about your ad variation and your ad types. So you have a lot of different ad types when you're actually on Facebook. You have videos, you have images, carousels, cannabis ads. Well, I think that's, there are probably more, but that's all I remember right now. Um, you want to pre-create and front load that creation so that you have everything that you care about for your bottom of funnel offer, like your core offer. And then you don't have to go back and forth and bug your designer to get new creative, like get that front loaded because you're now going to follow this blueprint instead and it's going to work for you. That allows you to have that full war chest of ads too. And then the last thing is that we would recommend automatic bidding to begin with and then you can set a target CPA later to bring it down. It just has a faster ad distribution for you. Um, campaign objective, 99% of the time, will be traffic or conversion. Um, and again, keep that in mind with the granularity point and the iceberg effect too. Is anybody running Facebook ads here? A few of you? Cool. You earned some uh, pepperoni. Awesome. Next one, account-based marketing. So not that long ago, I was introduced to a company called Listen Loop. And what ListenLoop does is it allows you to find individual prospects that work at companies when you are a B2B focused marketing you know, staff at your company as well, that you want to go out and earn their business. So what ListenLoop does is it allows you to actually upload a CSV or you can connect it to your Salesforce account and it goes out and finds these prospects online and cookies them with their triangular method, triangulation method is what they call this, and you can basically show your ad to them and have it follow them around on an individual basis, not the minimum required of like 100 visitors or 1,000 visitors, which is pretty dang cool. And I got a surprise for you guys too. What that basically allows you to do is that it flips your traditional funnel upside down because now you're looking to find that one person who went to your site or converted on your, um, your webinar landing page or your ebook landing page or anything like that. And you're trying to then find more people that work in that division at their company you're trying to then engage them across different platforms. So email, physical mail, social media, retargeting, things like that. And then you're trying to turn them into advocates. You're trying to give them more value. And so ListenLoop does something very, very simple. They basically take your logo and they automatically find your prospect's logo and they put it in this like little weird thing. And then after that, it fades to your actual message afterwards. The second thing it does, is this actually, did it not? Do anything? No? Nope. Okay, anyways. Um, the other thing it does is it allows you to see the individual company level reporting of the people you know, you're going after the work at certain companies. And it'll show you like the impressions and the clicks and the CTRs. But the coolest part is that you shouldn't just stop there because you can actually use another tool called Clearbit Reveal and Segment if you want to and actually de-anonymize your current visitors by their IP address and figure out what company they're from because this will allow your outreach to be a lot smarter as well, because you're not just going after people who, who never heard about you. These people have been on your site. They've read your blog post, they've done something. And so they're more receptive to your message when you actually go out for them, right? So the interesting thing is that you can then do this not just through Listen Loop itself, just the, the retargeting platform. You should think about this for the other things you're doing too in your efforts to, again, drive more business. And the crazy part is that Listen Loop itself is not that impressive, but it has a pretty amazing ripple effect when it comes to your other efforts, right? So your email efforts has a higher open rate and click rate and also helps your sales velocity too. So if you have a long sales cycle, it can actually speed that up is what we found. And I talked to the founder over there before I came and I was like, if anybody would want to try Listen Loop, is there anything that we can give them? And so he gave you this code, and if you actually spend $300, they will match that as well, so you'll get $600 of ad spend. Are you doing um, account-based marketing? You guys get to have some mushrooms. Cool. Next thing, um, Excel. I, I'm scared of Excel. I've done PPC for over seven years. I don't understand it. I will never be inside of it, but then some people at the company were showing me some pretty cool things. I was like, okay, I gotta put that in, but I'd never done a pivot table, so this might be like super one-on-one for you guys, but it was super impressive to me. <clears throat> so 
a lot of times we think about like two factors that influence our performance when it comes to PPC, like what keyword or what ad copy and what landing page, for example. We don't think about the combinations. We don't think about what time of day, what geography, what salesperson actually handled that lead. And can we figure out if there's a correlation between all these other points and which cohorts are then actionable for us to actually do something with? Because again, data is cool, but data is only cool if you can actually do something about it, right? Um, so the interesting thing is that you can actually download any data you want. You can go to the Keywords tab. You can hit the Download button. This is in AdWords, for example. You can then add it into Excel with the proper columns. And then you can actually insert, pivot. And this is where I lose some of the steps, because again, I'm not good at this. But you can look up some tutorials. And you can actually do something pretty cool with it, like this, which basically shows different types of ad copy along something called multi-ad group testing, where we're using the same type of copy across different ad groups and they account for faster testing. Once we find what works really well, we can roll that out with more confidence and again, lift everything up as far as performance goes. We did this too for one of our larger accommodation clients. We were really curious about the type of accommodation along with the geography, the CPA, and the LTV of that actual user that came through and we're able to figure out, well, where should we hold back some of the bids or lower our budgets, and where should we allocate more money to it, too? So if you guys are using Excel, you guys automatically earned some bacon. Cool. And now we're going to move on to the more landing page side of things, too. So um, back in March, I was working with 500 startups in LA, um, basically helping their batch of new startups figuring out like, how to get traction when it came to PPC. <clears throat> And they told us a pretty cool story. There was a company called Pigeon Box that actually allowed parents to send fun stuff and snacks to their kids in college. And they figured out they had so much extra inventory inside their warehouse that they were like, oh, let's build out this feature. And people can just add whatever they want to the box. That would be super, super cool. But what if nobody cared, right? Like, what if the engineers and the developers spent so much time and they launched it and it was just crickets without the cricket bar from earlier, right? Just the crickets. Um, that would suck. So there's potentially a lot of waste of time. So what they did instead was they just took a regular email to send to their customers, and they were looking for the minimum amount of proof that they needed to actually see if there was some type of intent to actually build this feature out. And all they cared about were link clicks in the email. And when they actually saw that it was like a 10% click rate, and the customers actually wanted to add something to the box, they just did it manually for the first time, but then they had enough proof that now they can actually build it out. And so their profit grew by 45% just from that. So a lot of us are thinking, like, we need to build so much content. We need to have so many offers on our landing pages for all the PPC traffic that we have. But I'm like, no, you don't. You can just fake it first, put a fake front as, like, as far as like a webinar or a quiz or a toolkit, an ebook, whatever you want. And then when they hit that button or they type in their name or email address, you just say, sorry, we don't have this right now. Because in that few little time frame that you can actually test that, at scale, you can now see which type of offers you should prioritize in actually building out. So we did this with our academy. <clears throat> we, did the, we put this on intercom. And if anybody was interested, when we were going to release our academy, just put in your email address. We did the same thing with our regular email subscribers and sent them this. And then we also did a pop-up and an unbounced landing page to see if people were interested. Of course, we went a little too far, but this is just for, for you guys for the example. Um, and if you guys remember from last year, I was talking about a company called Latote. So Latote is a female clothing subscription company, and their only goal was to get account creations where women would onboard themselves, tell them about their style that they would like, of clothes to get delivered, and then after that, they would sign up and pay, right? Now they become a member. So we were sending them to this unbalanced landing page, and it was a piece of cake, super, super easy. Generic search was... was um, we're getting a lot of conversions, but they wanted to run things on display, and it didn't work. And so we're thinking to ourselves, well, that's our core offer. We can't really change that. That's our business. Like, we, we can't, like, fiddle with that. What can we do differently? Well, let's try 50% off. And again, display network traffic did not care. They didn't, there was no intent to convert either. So we're thinking, okay, what is another thing that you guys have that we can use to actually get people to put their foot in the door and then see what happens later? And we're like, hmm, your newsletter. So we created ads for 50% off your first month, and just signing up for a newsletter, again, created the unbounced landing page with the features and benefits of the newsletter. And then as soon as they actually converted on that low ask, again, because that wasn't very threatening, we upsold him on the thank you page by creating the original request that we wanted, which was to create an account. And it worked like a charm. So, oh, here it is right here. 
Again, looks very similar to the other one, right? So we then, again, like I do with everything, like poop emojis and pizza slices and ice cubes and volcanoes, I'm trying to figure out like, what's an easy way to remember this and simplify it. And so when you think of the different channels that you actually have at your disposal, whether it be Facebook or display or video or search, you have to match the intent of the visitor, especially if they're brand, brand new and ice cold to your brand, with what you're asking them to do, which is very, very obvious, right? But it's not sometimes, because a lot of people try it and say, display doesn't work for us, or YouTube doesn't work for us, or Facebook doesn't work for us. And so it kind of falls on this kind of scale where display, direct display traffic is the coldest, search is the hottest. And what we also found, again, when it comes to smoke testing, is that these are the offers that work best for each different type of channel when it actually comes to getting conversions. And then again, upselling them, if you wanted to, on that thank you page, right? You don't have to wait a long time to nurture people. You don't have to worry about your email cadences being all good or following up with phone or retargeting. You can be much more aggressive sometimes. Um, so don't create these offers. Smoke test them first, fake them, and then have that data for yourself to actually go out and, and build them later. So if you guys are already doing that, add some broccoli. A lot of you guys are like saving your stickers because you want to use them for other things. That's fine too. So the next thing is something that Unbalance actually was talking to me about that we were doing, and we called them multi-step landing pages. And then I was like, well, what's cuter than that? The, the breadcrumb technique, we have to do that. And so if you guys know the story of Hansel and Gretel, do you guys know the story with the breadcrumbs and the witches trying to get the Hansel and Gretel into the house to actually eat them? We're doing the same thing with the visitors for our clients. Instead, we try to actually share the meal with them. We don't try to eat them at the same time. So if you heard any like, regular advice uh, when it comes to CRO, one of the most common things is like, hey, as much as you can, get rid of as many fields as possible. Because lowering the amount of fields is the best thing you can do to boost your conversion rates. So I'm, I'm thinking to myself, well, if you do that, then you're left with a name, email, and phone number, right? Like that's, you have to have that. But that's also the most threatening information from a visitor to give to you. So that led me to thinking that regular one-step landing pages are pretty much a gamble when it comes to conversion rates. Because to truly know what your visitors want, they want an answer. And they know that if they have to fill out name, email, and phone number, they have to wait for somebody to call them or wait for somebody to email them afterwards. And that's a problem, right? So of course, it's still valuable to test your headlines, test your hero images, your sections, your colors, and everything like that. That's important. And it's going to help you out. It's going to get you higher conversion rates. But the things that we found when doing the breadcrumb technique has been pretty astounding. In this situation, it was an online university that actually asked for, what year did you graduate high school? First name, last name, email, and phone number. All we did was we took the first field, put it on the first page, and performance bounced like that. And the reason why is because people, when they go through a landing page and they see on the first impression that you're not asking for name, email, and phone number, they think they're going to get an answer to the question. Like, how much does it cost to enroll? How long are the classes? Things like that. And if you can get them to micro-commit and micro-convert first, you're already ahead of your competition because they're going to actually start and finishing, uh, they're going to finish what they started, right? We did the same thing with the automotive side. You're making model first. If you notice a trend, name, email, and phone number is always on the last step. Always on the last step. Same thing with consumer goods. <clears throat> and the same thing with software. So this call to action was actually for a demo request. And the coolest thing is this is all built on Unbounce. Like, we, we, we use that religiously. And the reason why it works is because it's something called compliance psychology. If you try to be too aggressive with your visitors, and they know that, and all they have to do is click a back button to go to Google to click on the next ad to see if your competitor has a better experience than you, you're obviously going to lose, and it's not going to make a lot of sense for the both of you. You're going to be very unhappy. So the coolest thing is that two researchers named Scott Fraser and Jonathan Friedman, back in the 60s, I think, they did a little experiment. They went to a neighborhood and knocked on every single door there, and they were asking the people to say, hey, would you be willing to put up a sign in your front yard that says drive carefully? And it was about like a regularly sized sign, right? And 20% of the people said yes. They did the exact same experiment in a different neighborhood, very, very closely uh, tied to that original neighborhood, and they went door to door again, and instead of asking for the regularly sized sign, they asked for a much smaller sign that said drive carefully. And after they, those people said yes, they then immediately came in and asked them to put up the normal size sign afterwards, right? And that led to it from 20% to 76% of people saying yes. Because when you come with a small ask first, you're going to be better off on getting your chances to get that, that actual bottom of funnel, your core conversion that you care about. So that's something you want to keep in mind when you're actually looking at your landing pages again. 
And every single thing that you're doing when it comes to a new CTA that you're testing will always have new friction points. Michael Ogle, I'm Danish, so I can say his name that way, but Michael Ogle uh, last year was saying, one of the best things you can possibly do is talk to your sales team and ask them what the frequently asked questions that visitors have. Because that is a gold mine for actually reducing friction on a landing page and create new sections to explain what happens that they don't know about, right? So keep that in mind. And when you're using different types of channels, also keep in mind that everybody wants something differently. And you should smoke test these things. Because some people might want a corn dog, some people might want a beer. I had a lot of beers yesterday. That's why my voice is so bad. Um, so if you guys are already doing that, using the breadcrumb technique, kudos to you. It's an awesome thing you can do, and I think Unbound should really prioritize that on the, on the dev side to just do it automatically. Um, but you get some tomato. Cool. Let's see here. All right, another thing that we found, and again, this is more for bigger companies that, well, even if actually you're advertising in a couple cities or a state or nationwide, Hyperlocality basically allows you to appear more local to your visitors in your ad copy, your landing pages, and it will get you higher conversion rates, like almost guaranteed. I shouldn't say that, but there have been times, but um, that's a different story. Um, it's gonna be really good for you. So inside of AdWords, you can actually look at the, the dimensions tab. You can actually sort by the cities with the most traffic and start creating city-specific campaigns from that order. The next thing you're gonna do is you can create city-specific ads so basically, you have your root keyword, you're following the iceberg effect, you're creating skags, and you're also putting in the city name now inside your ad copy. Then, you're gonna go to your landing page. You're gonna use an area code specific phone number up in the top right or wherever you want, and you're gonna mention the city name in the headline somewhere as well. This is called dynamic text replacement inside of Unbounce. And I hope all of you are actually using Unbounce too because it's been a lifesaver for us as an agency. The next thing you then do is you can add in these parameters, and Unbounce will automatically read your URL and plug in the city name and the area code phone number or other types of text that you care about. And the perfect thing is that you don't have to create individual landing pages for every single city. It's all isolated on one so that you can also have faster testing on top of that. And this is just one example from this specific client that you just saw down here, opened up by about 30%, just right that, increase in conversion rates. So if you guys are doing that, you've earned some omega-3s. Sorry, there you go. <laughs> I have some fish. So the last thing I want to talk to you guys about is actually working backwards. And a lot of us are really, really focused on optimizing our PPC campaigns, like religiously, but not really caring about the landing page experience. And even worse than that, we're not really caring about the sales experience. And even worse than that, we're not even caring about our net promoter score or our lifetime values. So if you think about it, Again, the beauty of increasing your conversion rates is that if you double your performance there, you lower your CPA in half, you can be much more aggressive with your bidding, you can now get more volume, right? And it's kind of a seesaw, you have to have that balance. But what if you actually cared about your net promoter score? What if you cared about your lifetime values and what you can do now to make that better and bigger? And then worked at sales after that, and then landing pages, and then PBC last. Because as soon as you actually make those things to the right, work even better, everything will be much, much easier for you. And it just allows you to widen your actual funnels again and again so more people are growing to the next stage of whatever you care about. So if you're actually doing that, you get some cheese. So that's pretty much it. I hope you guys had fun. And I hope I see you at your booth um, and definitely at Science World tonight. It's our last night, so we're going to have a lot of fun. Thank you. <laughs>